Okay, today's video is um, from the recent exams in January 2024. Um, Unit 2, Edexcel Physics International A Level. Topics are waves and electricity. So these are normally taken in the summer exam. So I use this as a mock with my students. And this is a video to explain how to answer the questions. The first section is the 10 multiple choice questions. I'll read through it and explain as much as necessary. I'm going to go quite quickly because I need to get it done before tomorrow. A ray of light in air is incident on a glass surface. The angle of incidence is less than the critical angle. Okay. Um, which describes what happens to the ray of light? Okay. Well, the answer is A. It's partially reflected and partially transmitted. Remember, it's going uh, from air into glass. Okay. The critical angle is irrelevant because you're going into the optically uh, denser material. Okay. Um, the others you can see are not correct because uh, you can just do your own revision on it. So I'll leave you to try to work it out. Um, and a good way of going through these uh, papers is to discuss it with a friend who's done the paper at the same time and you can have a discussion about why each person has got it wrong if they've got it wrong. Okay, So some of these um, involve people actually going through it, so what I call peer assessment. Okay, There is a question too. There is an increase in the intensity of light instant on a light-dependent resistor, which is called an LDR. Okay, So LDR is a light-dependent resistor. This causes a change in the number of conduction electrons and a change in the resistance. Okay. So, number of conduction electrons is n in the equation I equals n a q v. Okay? So, it's the number uh, of conduction electrons actually per meter cubed. That's how you measure it per, for a specific material. So, which row in the table describes these changes? Well, if, if the number of conduction uh, increases, yeah, it has to be these two and um, resistance must decrease, so it has to be C. Okay, so I put ticks between which ones. It must be decrease in this column, increase in this column, so the only one that can be is C. Question three. An electron has a de Broglie wavelength. The de Broglie wavelength is approximately 3.5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. So that's lambda. Now we know that lambda equals H M over V. So this is from unit 2. Okay, so you can have a look at the, the formula sheet to see which equations they give you. And I have it on the side so I can have a look for you. Um, the de Broglie wavelength is given, just having a look, oh, right at the bottom. The de Broglie wavelength is the last equation on uh, the bottom of this page. Okay, so unit two, page one. Okay, lambda is h, which is Planck's uh, constant, divided by p, which is the momentum. Okay, so there's one page for unit two. So this is the last equation on the sheet given. So we know the, the wavelength, therefore we know that p is mv, and they want you to work out which of the following expressions, A, B, C, or D, gives the velocity of the electrons in meters per second. So in the equation, they put that as P. In other words, you need to know that P is M times V. That means M times V would be, if you change the subject of, of the equation, H over lambda, and therefore V is H over M lambda. So then you put the numbers in, and you'll find out that H is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34. So top must be... 6.6, so you can automatically reject C and D because they've got the H number at the bottom. So once you do your algebra, it has to be A or B, and in B, B the mass is missing. Okay, so A is the answer. Okay, now these values S the mass, and this is the wavelength given. Okay, so they've forgotten to divide by the mass in B. So these um, values for H and mass are in the data sheet. Question four. Which of the following describes a change in energy of one electron volt? Well, one electron volt 
by definition, is the amount of energy gained by an electron accelerated through a voltage of one volt. Okay, So two electron volts would be double that. So, and the way you work it out is the energy in joules is equal to the size of the charge, which in this case is an electron, multiplied by the size of the voltage. Okay, so That's what you've got to do. So an electron is accelerated across a potential difference of 1 volt, and it gains 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So the answer is C. And this is a, a known definition that you need to be very um, good at remembering, because it comes up in the exam every year. OK? I'll let you struggle through working out why the others are incorrect. OK, that's question four done. Question five is on the page on its own and you have two resistors, one with a voltmeter across it and one with a switch which is opened, okay, currently shown. So right now the current will go around here, through the 5 ohm, through the 10 ohm. So you've got a 1.5 volt, volt cell powering this circuit, and it says a cell has negligible internal resistance, so you don't have to worry about any internal resistance. Now remember this is basically the sum of the EMF, which is 1.5 volt, will be equal to the sum of the potential differences across the two resistors. So if, as it is now, the 10 ohm and the 5 ohm, the 10 ohm will get more than the 5 ohm to a ratio of 2 to 1. Okay, So this will get 2 thirds, it will get 1 third. But then it says the switch is closed. So if the switch is closed, the switch goes down. Now, instead of, it, instead of the current going through the 5 ohm, it's going to find an easy shortcut and it'll go it'll bypass the 5 ohm so it's as if you don't have the 5 ohm there therefore the only resistance is the 10 ohm so the 10 ohm gets the full emf because there's only one potential difference in the circuit okay so the answer is d all the emf goes to the 10 ohm resistor that's question five question six is a uniform wire attached to a meter rule. So you may have done this experiment before when you're trying to see how the length affects the voltage. Okay, so again, you've got a, it's powered by a cell, so you've got a voltage across this uh, wire. Okay, the wire is connected in series, so basically, um, connected in series in the circuit. So basically, this is the resistor, and this is the EMF, EMF and resistor. So the distance D, as you increase it, the voltage should increase. The bigger that distance, the more voltage. Right now, this distance gets a certain voltage and the rest of the wire will get the rest of the voltage. Okay, So if, the, if you had 50% of the uh, wire's resistance, then the voltmeter will be half of the value of the EMF. The distance between the connections to the voltmeter is increased. So if you make the distance bigger, then the voltage reading will increase. Okay, So if the distance is increased, the voltmeter will also increase, and they want you to see which graph is correct. Well, at the beginning, if the distance is zero, when D is zero, then there will be zero voltage because the um, voltage is directly proportional to the length of wire. Okay? Because obviously, it comes from R equals rho L over A. A doesn't change, the resistivity doesn't change, so the R is directly proportional to L. And as we saw from the question before, the voltage is directly proportional to the resistance. So basically, the bigger the length, the bigger the voltage, okay? Because the current is fixed. Okay, so the only question, the only graph which is correct, it starts at zero and increases as you increase it, and it's directly proportional. Okay, so the answer is C. Question seven is a microphone attached to an oscilloscope. Now, a microphone, as I was explaining to my younger students in year nine, a microphone takes the sound waves and connect, changes it to electricity. So obviously this is a constant uh, trace, so it's a constant frequency. Okay? The microphone detects the sound, the trace is displayed in the oscilloscope as shown. Okay? So the, the time, this, this direction, is each division is worth a certain amount of time, and it tells you the horizontal division represents a, each one uh, each square represents 0 0.015 seconds. Okay, there are, the period for is four divisions, so you can see the period is one peak and one trough. So the period is from here to the end of the first wave, 
So it's four divisions, which is four times the value given, which is 0 0.015 times four. So once you do that, you and you'll then know that the frequency is one over period, and therefore it's one over four times 0 0.015, and therefore the answer is D. Okay, I literally did this with my year nine students um, this week as well. Okay, as their introduction to waves. So that's question six and seven done. Question eight, at a point D from a source of light, the intensity is I. Well, intensity, yeah, is basically equal to uh, the power of the light. In other words, the wattage of the light divided by the um, area that it is covering. And this is the area of a sphere, because if you imagine, if you have a light source here, each time it goes out, it goes out spherically, three-dimensionally, and if that's the distance, yeah, as you go out, you double the distance, you will um, quarter the intensity because it's over uh, d squared. Okay, so this is called the inverse square law. So which expression gives the light intensity at a distance 2d? Well, that means the distance is doubled, therefore d squared is going to become four times as much, nothing else has changed, so the intensity will be a quarter. So the answer is B. Okay. Question nine, just move the paper slightly so you can see the whole question. Polarizing filters X and Y are arranged between a light source and an observer. So here's a light source. Um, so we'll put, we polarize in the direction of X, and um, if Y is in the same uh, direction, it's crystals polaroid crystals as x then the light will get through okay the intensity of light reaching the observer is a maximum that means all the light that can get through will get through okay that means x and y must be in the same orientation their crystals must be aligned okay the observer rotates filter x okay um, so the angle of rotation is shown in the first column the observer then rotates filter y Okay, so that the intensity uh, of light is a maximum again. Okay, which row in the table shows that this has happened? That, in other words, it's gone back to a maximum. Well, here he's changed this by 90 degrees. Remember, it was a maximum before, and this one by 80 degrees. So they're now out of phase by 90 degrees. So it's not going to be a maximum because one is out of phase by 90 degrees. Out of phase by 90 degrees means the polaroids are aligned at perpendicular directions to each other, so it will become a minimum, okay? So whenever there's a 90 degree difference, like here, 90 degree difference, then you're gonna have a minimum. 90, 90, and this one's 90. The only one which is 180, which means it's rotated 90 twice, they're back in phase again, the crystal orientations, so 180 degrees difference is to rotate the crystals back in the same uh, up and down direction for example. So the answer is C. Finally, the last of the multiple choice questions is about electron levels in atoms. Okay, so in an atom, an electron can drop, drop from level 2 to level 1, as shown. And in this case, a photon of wavelength uh, lambda is emitted. So each time a photon is emitted due to this gap, so basically delta E the gap between E2 to E1 will be equal to HF. Well, HF also equals HC over lambda, so you can replace it because they're giving it in terms of lambda. So you can change HF to HC over lambda. So therefore, E2 minus E1 must be equal to HC over lambda. But we want to work out which of the following expressions gives the value for E2. So you want to make E2 the subject of the formula. So you add E1 to both sides. So it's hc over lambda plus e1, which gives you the answer b. Okay, that's the end of the first section. Section b is now going into longer questions. So I'll do this uh, as much as I can through this video, and then I'll stop uh, and do the, sec the final part of this exam in a separate video. So it says light from a laser is instant at 90 degrees to a reflective surface as shown. Light from a laser is coherent. State what is meant by coherent. 
Well, so coherent means that it must be the same frequency, for example, laser is monochromatic, so that helps, okay, that the frequency is the same. But also, you, you also have to make sure that there is a constant phase relationship, yeah, for light to be coherent. For example, you've got two sources of light, and they have the same color, but they've got different phase relationships. And I think this is quite a complex topic, actually, if you want to go into it in detail. But this you need to know whenever you say it must be monochromatic or same frequency, which means it has the same wavelength in effect, it must also be because for it to interfere, for, for coherence, it's the condition for interference of light, there must have a constant phase relationship between the two sources. So normally this is only relevant when you're actually creating interference. But to, to put it in a nutshell, make sure you know and always include this terminology, okay? So I think light actually is a very complex topic and you can go into it more and more deeply and you'll probably find that this is an approximation of the truth. Then it says state of why a standing wave forms between the laser and the reflected surface. Okay, so the basically the light is going to reflect from the surface and then you've got the original light from the laser and the reflected light interferes with uh, light from the laser because they're going to go through each other. Yes, yeah, so it's going to hit there, go straight back and that produces what they call a standing wave where peaks and troughs will be formed. Okay, so it's all about interference. Question 11 done. Question 12 is a circuit containing a filament lamp when the potential difference across the filament is V equal to 8.9 volts. The resistance of the filament is 7.5 ohms. So they're giving you V, they're giving you R. Okay. Now remember, resistance increases with PD for filament lamps, okay, the filament bulbs. So they have a tiny little tungsten filament inside, and when they get hot, yeah, uh, which is what voltage does, because remember voltage is energy given to the charge, joules per coulomb. So when it gets hot, the resistance increases because of lattice vibrations, okay. So calculate the time taken for a charge of 5 coulombs to flow past a point in the filament. Well, charge you get from this equation... I is Q over T, okay, so we know that. We also know that I is voltage over resistance, so we know the voltage, we know the resistance, so you can equate these two equations, or you can work out the current, must be 1.19 amps, you then put it in here, and then you can, you want to work out the time, you know it's 5 coulombs, so it's 5 coulombs divided by 1.19, yes, um, I've got too many ones there, so that should be 1.19, yes, amps and you'll get an answer of 4.20 seconds if you're using three significant figures. Now most of the figures here are given to two significant figures so really you should round it up to two significant figures to get three marks. Okay? Some examiners will be tough on that. So whenever you see they're giving you two significant figures you should quote two significant figures in your answers to avoid losing um, marks which are avoidable. Okay, here you got a glass filled with a transparent, with transparent hydrobeads. So these are hydrobeads, whatever they are. It doesn't really matter. You do have to read through the information. The glass is then half filled with water. So the bottom is water, yeah? And there are hydrobeads inside. You just can't see them. The beads under the surface of the water seem to disappear as shown. So basically here, we don't see the hydrobeads because of the water, and they're going to explain it. The refractive index of the hydrobeads is very similar to the refractive index of water, okay? Well, hydro means water, doesn't it? Hydrated. So, explain why the hydrobeads are difficult to see when surrounded by water. Well, what is this question about? So, this question is about refraction, yeah? So, since hydrobeads have very similar refractive indices, so hydrobeads and water have very similar uh, refractive indices, there will be very little refraction, okay? because it says very similar, so that you shouldn't put no refraction, very little refraction at their interface, okay? Which means almost no change in speed or direction at these boundaries, okay? So that means the two materials will not appear to be different. No visible signs or refraction or reflection will take place. And I think you'll get one mark for, for saying those two bits. With refraction, there are two things that can happen. You can change direction, you can change speed. And that's what you see when refraction occurs. So for example, a dispersion uh, effect in a raindrop, for example, creates um, 
creates what you see called a rainbow. And a rainbow is basically refraction being observed because a light changes speed, changes direction, and you notice that. And different frequencies of light change uh, by different angles. So that's why you see the rainbow. Now, part B, it says, ray of light in air is instant on a damaged hydrobead just because it's no longer spherical. It's got a bit which is damaged here. The, the diagram shows a, the ray uh, until it is instant on the damaged surface. The ray comes in here, gets refracted, and then hits the damaged side at position X here. They've drawn the normals for you. Okay? Remember, all angles must be measured to the normal. Okay? The refractive index of the material uh, of the hydrobead is 1.38. I think water is about 1.4 or something. I can't remember. Okay? So... They want you so n is air is one, yeah. Hydrobead is one point three eight. They haven't mentioned water, but that was the previous part of the question. They want you to calculate the angle r inside here. Well, the equation at a level is n one sine theta one. So this is theta one. This is theta two. Is equal to n two sine theta two, where this is n two. And this is n one. Okay, material one, air, material two, hydrobead. Put the numbers in. You can then work out what. Um, the answer becomes, I haven't done it out because I've just gone by what the examiner to two significant figures. If you put the numbers in, do the calculations, do the inverse sign, you'll get 29 degrees. I'm sure you are all capable of doing that. I think I left it because I only had the examiner's marks with me and I hadn't um, done the calculation myself. Okay, so I'm just having a look while I'm talking to see what they put in the mark scheme. Yeah, yeah, so they've gone straight into the inverse section here, and they've worked out sine of 42 divided by thing, inverse sine, so they've gone from there to there, and that's what's in the mark scheme, which is why I didn't go any further, okay? So that's part two, you'll get 29 degrees. Then it says, for, for the second part, complete the diagram. In other words, what's gonna happen at this interface, okay? I've drawn it going as a total internal reflection. Complete diagram show what happens to the ray at position X. Your answer should include a calculation. In other words, how does that work it out? In other words, they now want you to use sine C equals one over N, okay? We know that. So if you do that, and this is literally what I've just taught my GCSE students as well, so if you do that from the from the value of refractive index, which was given as 1.38 in the first part of the question, you can basically work, once you know n, you can work out c. The c comes out to 46.4 degrees, and since 50 degrees in the diagram above is greater than the critical angle, that's the condition for total internal reflection to take place. So this is the calculation they want you to do. You get a mark for doing the calculation, and then you say since the angle is so and getting one for the answer since the angle shown 50 degrees angle of instance in the hydrobead is greater than the critical angle yes you should probably write it out in full just to make sure the examiner in a bad mood doesn't remove the marks from you yeah which is 46.4 degrees don't leave any chance for them taking it away remember i'm just explaining it to you you need to make sure you are crystal clear in your answers the total internal reflection must take place, and you show this on diagram. And if you've done all of that, you'll get your three marks. Okay, that's question 13 done. We're now on to question 14. A student investigates the EMF and the internal resistance of a battery. Okay, so the student connected a high resistance voltmeter across the battery. The battery was not connected to any other components. In other words, you just got a battery and a voltmeter. Now, if it's a high resistance voltmeter, and sometimes they're like up to a million ohms or approximately a million ohms, then you're going to get uh, like a micro volt, uh, micro amp going through here if you've got like a 1.5 volt um, uh, cell or whatever. They haven't told us what it is, but say you've got six, you'd be in micro amps anyway. So because the current is so small, they want to explain why the reading on the voltmeter gives the EMF the battery. Voltmeters have a very high resistance, so negligible current will be drawn almost equal to zero. Well, I'm talking about we're talking about microamps, yeah? Now, unless you've got a microammeter, you won't be able to measure it. But that microamps is also going through the battery itself or the cell. 
and therefore you're going to have some lost voltage but it's going to be negligible okay negligible loss volts so if it's negligible it means you can't really be measuring it um, remember loss volts is what you lose inside the internal resistance of the cell there it says there is almost zero current in the battery there will be no voltage loss in it loss volt is i the which was microamps times r which is the internal resistance so that's what they want you to know uh, a good voltmeter will measure the emf the student then investigates how the potential difference vary v very across the battery yeah so we put the voltmeter across the battery varied with the current in the battery okay where well, you have to have, draw a circuit diagram to be able to do this investigation where well, you need to have, somehow there's your battery remember battery is multiple cells so you need to have more than one cell shown so you don't lose the marks so the meters must be in the correct positions you'll get one mark for having the meters in the correct position and one mark for having a variable resistor so you can adjust the current sl slash voltage okay this is a core practical okay can't remember which number it is you'll have to look it up in your textbook that's question 14. once you do that the student plotted her results it says and the graph is shown well the emf at, at zero current the emf is the maximum voltage so you can automatically see the emf here is 8.8 .8 volts okay so we know that the emf is equal to the voltage externally plus the voltage lost internally so this is the lost volts yeah just so you understand this will be the lost volts inside the cell this is the voltage applied outside the cell the voltage available outside the cell will decrease as you increase the current okay the gradient of this line is the internal resistance okay so basically you've got emf equals v uh, plus ir well we got v on the y-axis so we change the subject of the equation it makes v equals emf minus ir okay whenever there's core practicals you've got to be able to do this y equals mx plus c that means the intercept is the emf yeah so the intercept is here so c equals that which is equal to the emf and the gradient is what you've got in front of the x value where the x value is current so the x value is current that means gradient is negative r yeah so n is the negative gradient so that that means it allows to work out the gradient will give us the internal resistance they want you to basically do what i just explained determine the emf and the internal resistance so emf is a y-intercept in the graph as i've explained to you here and this is a skill that you need for unit three as well so that's 8.8 .8 volts and the gradient if you do it carefully it goes downwards so it's 0 minus 8.8 .8 divided by 3.8 minus that gives you a negative gradient of 2.3 ohms okay two significant figures and you'll get the three marks okay for doing that make sure you show the values clearly that where you got them from your graph so you've put the zero so you could also draw the triangle so you could put uh, delta v there and delta I here to make sure that, that you've shown all you're working out okay that's part c of question 14 it then goes on to c part 2 explain why there is a maximum current that can be supplied by the battery well basically as the current increases the pd across the internal resistance will also increase because remember the pd across the internal resistance is the current you're drawing times the r yeah and when the loss volts yeah equals the emf yeah all of the emf will be lost internally in other words when r externally becomes zero that's when it happens because when r externally becomes zero or close to it the current will be so high it can't give a voltage outside the cell and that's how you get your two marks one for that and one for that okay so that's a good um, practice exam for unit three as well because it's core practical okay the next question we'll do we'll do one more question and i'll stop Question 15 is about a musical instrument, so it's about um, vibrations on a string. So a musical instrument called a harp looks like this. Okay, the strings are all different lengths, so they will have different frequencies. When a harp string is plucked, transverse waves travel along the string, forming again a standing wave because it's going to go down and back and uh, vibrate from both ends, and they're going to cause interference. State was meant by a transverse wave, waves in which oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer so again this is a GCSE level knowledge but you they in, in AS level they just want you to get the basics right then it says in part B the diagram presents one of the strings on the harp 
Okay, so this is the string. The string is fixed at both ends, as we know. Okay, so the, uh, the string is made to vibrate at its lowest frequency. The lowest frequency is also called the fundamental frequency, which has two nodes and one antinode. Add to the diagram to show the stationary wave on the string that we've talked about, the fundamental one. Okay, you should label any nodes and antinodes. Well, two nodes must be labeled, antinode must be labeled. This is where it is now, and it's going to vibrate between this side and that side. Basically, it's going this way and that way continuously, um, and that's what it's doing. And that's the fundamental frequency that it will display. And this is length, if you think about it, this is half a wavelength. Okay, so this length is equal to lambda over two. Okay, or lambda is twice the length. That's shown because that you may have to do in a calculation. And there is an equation on there. Okay, so that's the beginning of question 15. That's the scenario. Here's the bit where you have to do your thinking. One string produces sound with a frequency of 196 hertz. So I put F equals that. The wavelength of the wave, lambda, um, the wavelength of the wave on the string is 0.72 meters. That's a lambda. They're telling you the wavelength. So the lambda is 0.72. The tension in the string is 41 newtons. Uh, so we need the, the, the tension. Now, if you remember, there's an equation for that, which is the velocity of the string is equal to the tension divided by the mass per unit length. Okay, so we also need to have the wave equation uh, it, to be able to do it. And remember, mass per unit length is the mass divided by the length of the string. Okay, the mass of the string divided by the length of the string. This is another core practical. Okay, it's a lot of core practicals. Le learning the method in the core practicals will really help you, not only in the, th in, the, in the practical exam, but it will help you in the theory exam, because that's what they like to ask questions about. The string breaks, and the needs replacing with a new string. The table below shows the masses of four new strings, A, B, C, D, four different masses. Okay, A, B, C, and D. The length of each new string is 1.5 meters. Okay, so they're giving us the length, and here they're giving us the masses. Okay, the mass value is given. The new string is cut to the same length as the broken string, or well, presumably before it was broken, they mean, and is placed under the same tension. In other words, it's placed under the tension of 41 Newton, which was given to your question above there. See, the way that I write my questions out, I'm putting all the knowledge in already, so I'm already thinking before they ask me what they're going to ask me. Deduce which string, A, B, C, or D, should be used, okay, obviously to replace the broken string. So we need to use the equations we talked about. We need to use V equals F lambda because we know the frequency was 196 given to us in the top. And we know that the wavelength was 0.72, so we know the velocity. Why do we need that? Once we know the velocity, we can put it in there. Okay. Now, we want to work out the mu value Okay, because we know the tension and we know the velocity. So the only thing we don't know is mu, and they're giving us a mass of string. So we want to get to be able to use this equation up here. So we know the mu, yeah, from this equation is the mass per unit length, yeah. Um, so I've changed it to the equation around. So basically, if you change this to make mu the subject of the equation, I'm putting it there. Mu is tension divided by v squared. Well, we worked out the tension, the velocity for you. So we know the, the, the velocity and we know the tension. You just square the velocity and you'll get the value of 2.06 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per meter, okay? So basically the density of the, of the string per unit length rather than per unit volume. And since uh, mu equals mass per unit length and the length we were told is 1.5 meters for these things, we want to work out uh, what it comes out to. So we know the mass is going to be equal to 1.5 times this because this is per unit length and if we got 1 to 1.5, we need a mass of 3.09. Then the string would be 3.09 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. So the answer is 3.1 grams. And string B, you'll notice in the table, has a mass of 3.1 uh, grams. So you'll notice all these strings were 1.5 meters, which is why we had to multiply by 1.5 meters here. So once you got that, we know it's 3. This value is very close. 3.09 is very close to string B in the table above, so we have solved the problem. Okay, so we have got to the first half of this run through. I hope you found it useful, and I'll now upload it, and then when I have a little break, I will do question 16 onwards,
Okay, so we got 16, 17, 18, and that's it. So we've only got three questions to do, but the questions at the end are longer and take uh, a bit more explanation. But if you found that useful, please like and share my video with anyone who you know would benefit from it. And please subscribe so you know when the next video is going to be ready as we build up to the preparation for this summer's exam. The main focus will be Unit 2 and Unit 5, but if you're retaking Unit 1, I have that in the pipeline. So the January 24 paper will be with you on this YouTube channel soon. Okay, well, thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you in the next video. Bye for now.